Woo! Yeah! Awesome! Yeah! Welcome back from lunch, everybody. Uh, I hope you enjoyed lunch. Um, I, I, I got like the, the post-lunch spot. I hope you're all ready uh, to learn some stuff about how uh, Python and Rust work together. My name is Moshe Zadka. And my website is cobadism.com. That's where you can find every way of reaching out to me, known to humankind. I am not kidding. You should go to that. I want to start with an acknowledgement of country. I live in Hayward, in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, which is the ancestral homeland of the Ohlone people. And I'm so excited. This is my first time speaking in Ohio. Actually, I'm attending Ohio. Woo, yeah, awesome conference. Love it, love it. Um, and this completes my goal of talking at every single uh, US Python regional. So I deeply thank all of you for helping me achieve uh, my, my life dream. So thank you all. OK, uh, let's dive into that. Um, let's first start, start talking a little bit about Rust. Uh, because it might not be familiar to you coming to a Python conference. It might be even talking about Rust. So I'll explain what Rust is. I'll explain why Rust is. And then I'll explain how to use Rust with Python. So what is Rust? Uh, it's a programming language. Hopefully we have this kind of as a baseline. Uh, it's a low-level programming language. Now, low-level has a lot of definitions for a lot of people. Um, what I'm going to say is not true, but you should treat it as true when you write Rust code and when you think about Rust code. Uh, when you add two numbers, it's one machine instructions. Right? And that's more or less true. That's true enough. And this is like for me, like what, what does it mean for a language to be uh, uh, low level? That, sorry, what you write is pretty much what you see. Um, Rust does feature uh, low, zero cost abstractions. So, the definition of zero cost abstractions is also somewhat subjective. So I'll give you like you know my definition, my interpretation of how uh, Rust does that, which is that you can do very high level things which translate to things that don't actually cost extra at runtime. For example, if you pass a Rust uh, a, 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 um, a, a struct in Rust on the stack. Struct in Rust on the stack. Man, I got a real tongue twister here. Um, so if you pass a struct in, in Rust on the stack, um, then it's equivalent to just uh, uh, more or less passing like the, the different values, and it's pretty fast. And like you know, the copies are really fast. So that's like what I mean by zero cost abstraction. Uh, it costs nothing if you don't use them, and if you use them, it costs exactly what it would need to cost if you are using like you know much you know like less uh, uh, safe language. Which brings us to. Memory safe. Now, I'm sure that if you read anything about uh, Rust, you heard that it's memory safe. You might not know what memory safe means. So I'll give you the exact definition that um, Rust uses for what it means to be Rust safe, to be memory safe, which is as long as you don't do two things, as long as, well, as long as two things don't happen, your code can never have uh, um, a mist free or or like uh, using uh, um, any any freed space using unallocated space. So what are these two things? Uh, the first is the bug in the compiler, right? If the compiler has a bug, your code might be perfect, but it might generate invalid code that somehow does segmentation fault. The other thing is any code that is in an unsafe. Um, Section so you can mark special code as like unsafe and Rust does not check for safety in code and obviously if you call in, in into any unsafe code and here's like the dirty secret that I think it's important to understand and it's important to understand why it doesn't really destroy uh, everything I said no reasonable Rust program can be created without calling into some unsafe library code okay well. I just told you that if two things, one of two things happen, your code is not going to be memory safe. And I also told you that uh, one of these things will almost always happen. So why is like memory safety even like something that you know we talk about when we talk about Rust? Because if you Rust, you, if you write your unsafe block correctly, you can write it in a way that no safe code can trigger that, right? So you can think of it just as an extension of a bug in the compiler. It's just that, like, you know, you get to, like, you know, write parts of, like, you know, this low-level code and parts of that code. But the only way 
to have a memory safety issue in Rust is if the compiler on the unsafe code has it. Presuming that people who wrote these were careful enough, you can never have any kind of uh, bug in in a memory, memory safe bug in Rust code itself. If you think about it, that's not very different than what we say, when, when we, what we mean when we say that Python is memory safe. If the Python interpreter has a bug, or some of the code that is low level and reaches directly into the C level has a bug, then it's not gonna be, uh, it's not gonna be memory safe. But we still are comfortable in our day-to-day -day life calling Python a memory safe language. So I feel like it's a reasonable definition. Okay, so why Rust, Why right? There's like so many programming languages. Why do we need another one? Well, it has pretty good performance, right? Because it's low level, it has zero cost abstraction. You can write Rust code that has similar performance to like say C code or assembly code, right? So that's good, right? Sometimes we need, you know, to make computer go brr. Uh, but on the other hand, there's alternatives to performance, right? I just mentioned C, C++, assembly. They all are as performant as Rust, but they are not safety. It's very hard to write a safe, um, a safe program in any of these languages. So why is a combination of performance and safety important? So uh, I'll give you like my abstract example, but I think it's like pretty much is like the generic example for why Rust is so cool. Low level parsing. Now, I don't know if you know that. Rust came from the Mozilla project. What does the browser do? At a certain layer, the most important thing that the browser does is take HTML stuff and like parse it, right? Like figuring out like the tree structure from the HTML. Now, the people who wrote that HTML code might not like you. I don't know why they don't like you, right? I like you, I think you're all great people, but you know, they don't like you for some reason, right? So some of these people, yeah, right, will try to write HTML code that specifically will trigger memory issues in whatever you use to parse it. On the other hand, there's a lot of HTML out there. You want your browser to parse that HTML very fast. Right, it's similar with any other low-level networking protocol. Does message with JSON, HTTP, Quick, all of these things, right? And this is a very common problem to have. You often need to read a lot of data coming from potentially untrusted sources, right? So I think that like, having this kind of example of like, why Rust is useful, low-level parsing, is really good to, to have this as your model for like, should I be using Rust? So obviously if I tried to write like an actual parser, uh, we would be here all day and it would not be very useful. So my very simple example for a low level parser is gonna be counting. But it's not actually not gonna be counting, right? If you think about it, a parser has to give like a specific value. My example, you can think of it as a validator, right? It's not a counter, it's, it's a validator of counts. Right, which is a very important part of a parser to make sure that the data is valid. So the parser checks it's a certain character appears at least X times. Right? That's reasonable, right? This is like the, the toyest version of like, you know, what it means to validate data. Um, and to make it kind of a little bit interesting, so I can show you a few of the interesting fun uh, features, um, I'm going to talk to you about, uh, I'm going to make it have, be able to reset on either spaces or lines, or new lines, and that's going to be optional, right? So we can have a more interesting API. And, you know, obviously it's a toy example, right? Like, you know, you don't need that. But why do I think that this example is interesting? So, if you didn't have any Rust code to do that, could you do it in Python? Sure, you could write a for loop over characters in Python, but that's really slow. Well, you know, if you're really clever, maybe you can find some tricks with NumPy, but then NumPy would read the entire buffer, right? Because that's how you'd use it, unless you're like very, very clever. Now, often, like, you know, if you have like five characters right at the beginning, you don't need to like, you know, go and read like the whole one megabyte buffer. So if you think about it, if you write it in a low level language, right? If you write like a simple loop in C, it would be super fast, but then, you know, maybe you have like, you know, a read pass to the size and then like, you know, someone crafts like a very interesting string and crashes your program. So this is a toy example, but it's still a convincing enough example for like, okay, I need to do it on like, you know, one megabyte, five megabyte buffers and um, I want to ask it for that. So hopefully this, is, this convinces you that this example is like at least somewhat realistic. So it's just interesting enough to uh, have code 
but not interesting, too interesting so I can actually show you the whole code. So the first thing we want to do is, is have reset, right? Um, so you, know, you might have no reset, you might have spaces reset, and you might have new line reset. Um, I guess as an intro to like all my Rust code, I am not following Rust best practices. I'm trying to explain how to like interface with between Python and Rust, and the code is mostly designed to fit on slides. So uh, you shouldn't take that as an example for like how to write the best Rust code. Um, but here's basically the you know the parameters of the parser, if you will, right? Like the minimum count, the, uh, the with the character we're looking for, the minimum count, and whether we're using reset and what kind. Okay, so you can think of it as like the parameters of the parser, right? The pragma of the language or, or whatever it is that you wanna think about. Um, and so let's implement the uh, counter, right? So we want to implement a single method that's called has count, and it takes some data, and it says whether it has that count or not. Um, as you can see, just calling an external function because that makes it easier to uh, uh, get on a single slide because that one has all the decoration, right? This is like a struct with a method. So like, how do we implement has count? So uh, all variables in Rust by default um, are immutable. Uh, if you want a mutable variable, you have to say, this is a mute variable, right? So current count is gonna have to change because we're like keeping count and seeing if we can uh, exit early. And then we, we call a function called gut count, and you can see that um, if I was doing it in a different language, I would just pass the address of current count. Here I wanna say I'm passing the address of current count as a mutable into the function, right? So at the point you pass, you also have to be explicit. Yes, this, this function might actually mutate the current count. So um, now the only function I have to implement is gut count. So gut count first uh, checks if it needs to reset, then checks if it needs to increment, and then it returns whether the current count is bigger than the, um, uh, the minimum. Reset is pretty simple. Um, it basically uses matching, so if it's new line and you're asking to uh, reset on new lines, or it's space and you're asking to um, reset on spaces, uh, then it resets, otherwise it does nothing. Right, so that's a very useful function. And increment similarly, right? If, if it's the right character, it increments. Again, most of the time you'd inline that code, but uh, I want you to fit on the slide. One thing that's important is that the Rust compiler is pretty smart. It knows that this, like, unlike Python, it has enough information to know that nobody at runtime is gonna change where these functions are pointing to. So it's fine if you read it, because like, again, most of the time it will have zero cost abstraction. It will inline these functions if it, it makes sense. You know, maybe you can hint it, but like usually it will probably make a good, a good decision and you probably don't wanna have to worry about it. Okay, like I said, um, these are not necessarily uh, the best practices. Um, I didn't try to write in a good code style. I didn't co even come up with like a great API because really I wanna focus on like, okay, now we have code. I showed you that writing high performance code in Rust to solve the toy problem that I gave you is, is easy and feasible, right? I did it over a few slides that can take you like, you know, 15 minutes if you know Rust, right? So that's fun. Right, but, but it's not necessarily the best API. Um, so okay, fine, like you know, yeah, now you have some Rust code, but your code is in Python, right? You know, like maybe you want to have Python actually connect to the network because it needs to like, you know, interface with a complicated configuration file that's much easier to do in Python, you want to iterate quickly, and so on. So um, we're gonna use something called PyO3. There's a lot of like weird oxygen chemistry jokes in Rust. Uh, I'm not responsible for any of those. Um, O3 is ozone. I'm sorry. Um, the nice thing about PyO3 is that you write all the code inline, so you don't have a separate interface code. You can li literally inline your definition. Um, obviously, if you have a pre-existing Rust library, you need to write a wrapper in PyO3. But if you're writing, um, code specifically to solve this problem of I need to optimize my has count because I tried it in Python and people are complaining that it's too slow. You can just write it in, in, in Rust and then uh, put the interface directly there. 
uh, which means you can modify it together, right? I told you this is not a good API. Well, that's fine, right? If you want to modify the API, you just modify the API and you modify the inline declaration in the same time, and you just generate a, you know, a different API from your Rust code. Right, that's pretty cool. Um, you need to include some, like, you know, boilerplate. That's not very interesting. Um, and then you notice that what I do is I decorate the reset. Right, these are very similar to, like, how we do decorators in Python. The things that come bet before, like, a definition, and they modify it. So in this case, it says it's going to be a Py class. Uh, to make something a Py class, you have to make sure that it's clonable and copyable. Now, it's very easy to understand how you clone and copy enums, right? They're basically just a number. You just copy the number. Um, so this tells us, generates the obvious methods, right? Someone already wrote, like, you know, the, the obvious way to clone and the obvious way to copy, and this tells us, you know what to do. Just do it. Um, and again, we have the struct of the counter. We decorate it with a Py class. That one we don't have to make uh, copyable and clonable. Um, but when we do the impl, right, remember this is the part where we uh, actually wrote the code for has count. Um, then we need to decorate the Py methods. That's fine. It will decorate all the methods. All the methods will become available in Python. But there's one method that is special, right? You want it so that, you know, you can just call the constructor as though it was a Python, um, a Python object, right? Because you don't want people to know that you've switched from uh, Python to us for your implementation. So you mark the new thing as a new, and that will make the Rust thing know that, like, you know, when people call the constructor, call this code. And so this code takes the character, takes the minimum number, takes the reset, and returns a counter. And, you know, the code is like the obvious, right? It just puts the stuff in the right place. Um, and then you need to write like the module initialization code. Um, as you can see, one interesting thing is that module initialization code can always fail. That's what it means to return a pi result. It means that like, you know, if there's a failure, it will fail. Now, what ways it can fail? You don't have to care. The reason you don't have to care is because of this uh, uh, cool question mark, right? So you do add class counter and add class reset. Now again, most of the obvious failure modes have been like impossible and detectable at compile time. But maybe like there's a memory allocation issue deep inside the guts of Python when it happens and it can't do that. The question mark says if this fails, make the whole function fail. And then the second function, so you can think of it as like, you know, if this is an error, just return an error directly. If this is an error, return an error directly. Otherwise, return OK. So the question mark prevents you from having to, like, you know, do all the if else yourself. And you see it very often in Rust that it has a pretty good macro system. And so boilerplate will usually get um, kind of uh, in, a, in, a, in a macro. Right? Sometimes the macro is half built in, like with question mark, but it's only half built in. Your question mark just calls a very specific macro in Rust that knows all the right details. Uh, sometimes the macro has to be explicit, which is why we use a uh, Py module. Okay, so that's pretty cool. So we have the code. We need to run it. Right? Um, all you need to do is in your virtual environment, install Maturin and do Maturin develop. It will take care of everything for you, meaning it will actually install the module into your virtual environment, so it will automatically call the Rust compiler. It will set everything up. You don't have to think about it. Just create it, mature and develop, and that's it. You can peep in, you can uh, uh, you can do the you can import it. The other alternative, right, when you want to ship, is mature and build. Again, you barely have to think about anything. Mature and build will produce a wheel. This will be just a regular wheel. You can upload it to PyPI if it's open source. You can put it in your like dev PI if you have an internal dev PI or whatever it is you do with wheels. You can put it in a directory and give the directory to pip. What, whatever you do with regular Python wheels, just do with mature and develop. How am I doing the time? Pretty good. Cool. OK, so what's step number two? There is no step number two. You can just use it from Python. So uh, I call the module counter, as you remember. So you need to import counter. Again, whether you use mature and develop or you use mature and build and, and pip install the wheel, you have the counter module. It's available. 
you create the counter object. Right, remember, this was kind of supposed to look like a compiler with pragma, so like you first create the counter object, and then you uh, call it. So in this case, I'm trying to count the C character. I want you to uh, figure out if it has at least three Cs, and I want to reset on new lines. Right, of course I could choose other parameters, but these parameters are just very easy to uh, demonstrate. So let's demonstrate. I want counter has count CCC, that's true, why it costs three thieves. But if I add a new line? Right, so now there's new lines between the first two C's and the next C, so after two it resets, then there's only one, gets to the end of the screen, <coughs> gets to the end of the string, and it's done, right? So, you know, maybe I could have do, did an optimization where one character before the end of the screen, you know that even if it's a C, you're not gonna finish. I didn't put that optimization, but it's pretty close to optimal, right? It will read, more or less just enough of a string to figure out the situation. So, uh, why? Right, I just show you how you can, instead of writing this code in Python, how you can do more work, right? Not a lot more work, hopefully I convinced you that this is not like a huge overhead in your uh, regular development practice, right? Like you can easily imagine how you'd integrate this with CI, you can imagine how you'd integrate it with people's regular dev flow, you just need to add the right dependency on maturing and so on. But it's pretty easy, but it's still not zero, right? It's still more work than just writing the code in Python. Right? So why? Why do I do it? Well, um, the first thing is that like I want you to remember it was easy right um, but the specific differences between Rust and Python right so Rust is a very high performance language again I didn't do like uh, timing of this code and I even did like a debug build so it wouldn't be that fast but if you actually show timing even a debug build in Rust is like easily 10x the speed of if I did like a for loop in Python over the character. It just has so much overhead in Python. It has to literally construct a string object on every go through the loop, right? That's very expensive. Uh, it's safe, right? Uh, again, imagine that this co th these things come from something that um, I don't trust. But they still need to verify that they have like, you know, exactly three, or at least uh, three, three times uh, uh, the C character. Right, so um, I want to make sure that bugs in my code don't lead to like you know someone taking over my uh, my program. Right, so that's a good combination, but uh, it has a big learning curve. Right, I gave you like a little taste of Rust. Hopefully, at the very least, it convinced you that it's different from any other language you know significantly. Right, and I didn't even show like the biggest differences. Right, sometimes you need to like specify lifetimes and be very careful. Right, so there's a, a real learning curve in Rust, and it's awkward to prototype. Right, because if nothing else, you need to run like maturing develop after each time you change the code. Right, you can't just reload Python code. In this example, it's not that big of a deal because it's like one file. But again, a more realistic scenario will have a lot more. Uh, Rust code, and the compiler will take some time. So it's more awkward to like, you know, quickly run a prototyping loop and say, oh, you know what? I also need a max count. Let me add a max count, and then you need to change all your code. Oh, actually, like, I, I need to like, you know, allow reset on a bunch of other characters. I need to allow reset on spaces and new lines, so I need to change the whole API now. That's fine. You know, if you were writing it in pure Python, that would be a lot faster than now, right? So like, it's, it's more awkward to prototype, right? That's why we like Python, right? So Python is easy, right? Uh, um, you know, I, I've seen people joking to the, even today, right? That like you know you can teach, you know, teachers to teach that in like a day, right? They won't write amazing Python code, but they will write Python code, right? It's, it's a pretty easy language to teach, right? That's fun. Um, it has a tight iteration loop, right? Again, like you know, if I modify something, I can modify it inside the REPL, right? And like you know. You know, write, put the code in a Jupyter cell and just like, you know, enter, 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 right? Or like, you know, put it in some code and run PyTest over and over. That, those things are very, very fast. Why? Right? This is nice. It's nice to have a tight iteration, uh, especially when you're not sure what you're actually going to do. But it has a speed cap, right? Like, there's only so fast, so much speed you can take out of Python, right? Sure, you know, I, I explain why a for loop on a string is bad. Okay, well, you know, you can convert the speed to an array. 
And that will mean that you don't have to like, you know, uh, uh, create a string on every iteration loop. So you can speed up the naive Python code. But you can only speed it up you know, by a factor of two, three, four. The Rust code, even in debug mode, could easily be 10 times uh, faster, right? So the fastest, the, the most performant you can make your, um, your Rust code, it's still not gonna, your, your Python code, it's still not gonna hold a torch to something you do with a really low level language. Um, so, you know, the solution, like, like exactly what we learned in kindergarten, right, is to cooperate, right? We each bring our own strengths and, and together we build a better thing, right? So you can prototype in Python, figure out the API, figuring out, you know, like, you know, oh, these samples I need to reject, these samples I need to do, or like, you know, hey, you know, I, I need, really need like these kind of error messages from the parser because people end up depending on them, right? It's really nice to prototype in Python. And then the, the nice thing that you already prototyped in Python, that means that you already can measure. You can already profile. You can see where your bottlenecks are. Well, that's great. Now you just take those performance bottlenecks, assuming you wrote a halfway decent um, API. And even if you didn't, you can first refactor it in Python. You know, try to like, you know, first like, you know, kind of optimize the Python reasonably well. Right now you already know which parts you tried as hard as you could and couldn't. And you can move them to Rust. Um, so it's stronger together, right? Like you can, uh, you can develop together and you can deploy together, right? You just deploy them like you do any other wheels, right? Presumably if you had any kind of non-trivial Python code, you already are depending on some binary wheels. You already figured all these details out, right? Like you don't have to change any of the stuff that you've uh, figured out to use them together. Um, so I hope that gave you like another tool in your uh, in your toolbox as you're developing Python for that kind of use case, right? When you have to uh, get a lot of data, and what's code has to struggle with some sort of data at some point in its life. When you have to get a lot of data and return some sort of summary from that data, then now you have another tool in your toolbox, especially when you're facing with performance bottlenecks. Um, so that's it. Folks, uh, thank you for, so much, uh, and you've been a great uh, post-lunch crowd. Thank you so much.